just thank a few people. I know Catherine and Hakeem were on stage doing the Gamecocks for Obama cheer. I want to thank them for all their work. Uh, I want to also recognize um, Hans Riemer. Uh, Hans, can you come out and just wave? Uh, Hans is the <laughs> to acknowledge our organizers on the ground. Uh, hopefully you, many of you, will be in that position. Um, this campaign is where it is because we've got so many phenomenal young people who have given up so much of their lives. They've left school, they've left their jobs, they are living on people's floors and homes all over this country uh, because they are believing in something beyond themselves. Um, that is the tradition that Barack has come from. The first thing he did after college was to work as a community organizer, uh, knocking on doors, working with church groups. Um, so he understands the importance of young people engaging. So we are so grateful to Hans for the work that he's doing, for getting you all engaged. Hopefully this will be the foundation upon which you will build the kind of future where change is possible. Because we need you. We can't do it without you. So let's give Hans a round of applause. The Gap Choir, Bridgel and North East High School. I heard you all doing it up. Thank you all for being here. Wonderful job. And we also have a special guest with us that you all should know who is here. Uh, my sister-in-law, uh, the eldest sister of Barack Obama, Alma Obama, who is here from my home. Uh, the Obama family, she is a a project director with CARE International, uh, working in Kenya uh, to work with sports and youth. Um, so service runs deep in our family. Uh, and you all should take the time after this to make sure you talk to and hear from Alma. Uh, she has lived a phenomenal life, has spent time in Germany, speaks fluent German and Luo. Um, and she is the mother of a beautiful 10-year-old, our niece, uh, of Kenya, who is now in England. She's a world traveler, uh, and she's somebody to know, so hopefully you all will get a chance to say hello to her. Um, so if you haven't heard, my husband's running for president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and on Saturday, right here in South Carolina, you can push that endeavor one step closer. Um, your involvement as young people is critical uh, because if you recall at the start of this race, um, before Barack Obama was Barack Obama, he was just a guy that gave that nice speech at the Democratic National Convention. The first reaction was there's no way that he could be competitive in this race, right? Um, for one thing, he said, yeah, you know, he can energize young people, but young people don't vote. You know, people already discounted you from the get go. <laughs> They just assumed, as do many politicians, political campaigns, they write you off because their view is that if you don't go to the polls, you don't matter. So they don't even try to talk to you. Uh, but what we saw in Iowa, what we saw in New Hampshire, what we saw in Nevada uh, was that the voices of young people can make a phenomenal difference. Uh, and in every state where there has been a caucus or a primary, uh, the numbers of participants have doubled and tripled, and a lot of that is because of the youth vote. Um, so you have to know your power. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing this, and people ask me this all the time, uh, is because, quite frankly, I don't feel like we have a choice. Um, you know, Barack and I could live a very peaceful life. Uh, we both have wonderful education. Uh, Barack is a best-selling author. Uh, our student loan debt is finally paid off. <laughs> um, and we could live comfortably for a long, long time. Uh, but then I start thinking about, not me, but my kids. Uh, I got these really cute little girls, Ali and Sasha, nine and six. They are a mess. The two of them. They keep us laughing. Um, but I worry about the world we're going to hand over to them, the world that you all are about to inherit. Because like it or not, cynical or not, this is your mess. <laughs> Whatever we have done over the last several years and decades will be yours. Um, and there is no way around that. Whether you vote or not, whether you've got a job or not, whether you finish college, 
these problems will be yours. Um, so it's too late for y'all. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I really start thinking about my girls. Uh, because let me tell you, there's nothing more important to me than my children. And I know you all come from households where your parents think you're terrific, that somebody thinks you're the world. Well, I feel that way about my girls. Um, and we, as a nation, think we feel that way about all kids, right? I mean, if there's one thing that we say we can agree on in this country, it's that we care about our children. Uh, but the truth is, is that these precious gems that we care so much about, we're about to hand them over a mess. Uh, because we are still at a point in time in this nation where we aren't getting it right. Um, we are not getting it right. And the folks who have been at trying to get it right have gotten it wrong. Time and time and time again, I've spent my life sitting in my kitchen looking at the TV screen and going, what is going on? Who are these people? <laughs> and whose lives are they reflecting in their choices because it's not mine? Um, I am frustrated and have been frustrated. So I don't think we have a choice because we're still in 2008 in a time where, where we have overcome so much in this country, right, that we're still a nation that's too divided. I mean, we live in isolation from one another. You know, maybe when you're on a college campus, there's a rare opportunity that you live with people who are not like you, where you are forced to engage and have conversations if you take advantage of it where you are potentially going to talk to somebody who doesn't agree with you, who lives in a different way. But we don't do that throughout this country. People live in isolation. Uh, and they tend to believe that their pain is unique to them, that their struggles are unique to them. And we become more isolated. And we're still a nation that is way too cynical. And the cynicism starts so young. You know, the number of young people of voting age don't even bother when we have places in Africa where people are fighting and dying for their right to vote and engage in some kind of democracy. We live in a society where many of our young people just can't be bothered. You know? They got vacation to go to. They got something else going on. They fell asleep. I couldn't get up. I studied too late. I was out too long. We're so cynical. As if these problems are not our own. As if somehow miraculously we get health care and our garbage picked up. We get college loans because we're just nice people. We're too cynical. And we're still a nation that is just too mean. You know, and I know this, especially at this age, there's just a lot of nasty that's going on. Bad talk, wrong tones. Um, and it has become a characteristic that we tend to reward in the society rather than uh, try to suppress uh, in a way that's disturbing to me, particularly because I have little girls. And I'm trying to teach them not to be that way. But I am fighting an uphill battle, and it's not just in our politics. It's in every aspect of life. We mistake toughness for meanness. Uh, we wear this armor of mean. Um, and we are certainly a nation that is too guided by fear. Uh, we have become afraid of everyone and everything. And we spend more time in this country telling folks what they can't do, what won't work, what can't change. Uh, and the problem with fear is that it clouds our judgment. You don't make good judgments when they're based on fear because if, if we did that, we'd be fine. <laughs> we'd be living well because we have certainly heard a lot of fear mongering over my lifetime. But it doesn't work. Fear cuts us off and it leaves us in this isolation. And it has certainly cut us off from the rest of the world in ways that aren't healthy. And the problem with fear is that it creates this veil of impossibility. And it is over the heads of all of us. Uh, and it affects and infects all of us in ways that don't work. And the problem for me is that we pass on that fear to our children. And then we create a generation of doubters. Because when people are spending more time telling you what you can't do, you start believing it and you start hesitating, and you're timid, and you become insular. And see, I don't want that for my girls. And I, I think that by now, in 2008, we should be at a point in time with these precious little kids that we love to dream of being anything, regardless of where they were born, their political party, their race. We should be at the point in time when a child is born and can dream and imagine anything for themselves. 